Hello, everyone, and welcome to True Blue Crime Podcast. I'm Dan. I will be your host. This is episode one, and this is my first adventure into podcasting. A little bit about me. I was a police officer for 17 years, worked as a patrol officer and a crime scene technician. And as a crime scene technician, I investigated uh, crimes all the way from small-time crimes up to several homicides. I have a love for true crime uh, podcasts, listening to them as I um, do housework, drive uh, up north to the cabin. Uh, I live in Minnesota, so uh, there's a lot of summer trips up to the cabin that I enjoy, um, and I enjoy listening to the true crime podcasts as I do. So as a result, I decided I would start a podcast covering some famous cases and and some not-so-famous cases and lend my expertise uh, from my many years in law enforcement uh, into the podcast itself. Um, I hope to be able to at least do a case every couple weeks here, do the research for it, uh, write it out, and uh, present it to you fine people. Most of the cases will probably be solved cases because I enjoy breaking down the investigation and the uh, outcome of the case to a certain degree, but I will also not fear venturing into some of the unsolved cases to see um, if I can offer my two cents in regards to why they're unsolved or you know if there's any chance I think they are going to be solved. So first off, thank you to everyone for tuning in and listening to this podcast. And uh, at the end of the podcast, I'll provide some contact information if you have any suggestions, questions, um, or um, I guess, yeah, suggestions for cases that uh, sh- that you'd like to see covered. Please tell everybody that you can about the podcast. Uh, I hope that you, if you enjoy listening to it, that uh, by word of mouth, this will spread and uh, people can enjoy the podcast just like I enjoy several of the fine true, tri- true crime podcasts out there. Um, so for my first case, I chose a rather large one. Even if you're not from Minnesota like I am, you possibly know the case of Jacob Wetterling. Uh, This is a case that changed my life, I guess, in a certain degree, at least shaped it, I should say, in regards to uh, just some of the similarities that that I had with the victim and uh, some some of the impacts that this case has on, has had on me. If you're not familiar with the case of Jacob Wetterling, Jacob was an 11-year-old boy who was abducted outside of his home in the small town of St. Joseph, Minnesota. Uh, St. Joseph, Minnesota is a a small town about 75 miles northwest of the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities uh, metro area. It's located just outside of St. Cloud. Um, It's kind of the the closest large city um, in uh, as you head up towards northern Minnesota. Jacob was abducted on Sunday, October 22nd, 1989. As a side note, a lot of these cases that I'll be doing, I, I, I will probably tend to focus more on cases that have cur- occurred within the last uh, 20 years or so as, as a lot of my expertise and recognition of investigation patterns and whatnot will mirror um, more recent cases. But exploring some older cases from time to time, uh, it's is a good way to look back on how uh, law enforcement and true crime has changed in um, you know something as recent as 30 years ago. As I go, I will try my best not to venture off onto too many tangents, uh, get the story out, but there will be times as I'm telling the story that I will need to address a certain issue. Um, but I'm going to try to save most of my analysis of the case and the investigation and whatnot for the end. Just just try to make it as, as narrative followed by analyzation as I can. So in, in the case of Jacob, uh, on Sunday, October 22nd, 1989, uh, Jacob's parents had gone to a friend's house and uh, Jacob was in the house with two of his brothers and his good uh, friend next door named Aaron and Aaron's older sister. So there are five kids staying at at the home that evening. Now, this is October, late October in Minnesota. 
it gets dark rather early as a result. So during my research, I found that, uh, I don't know why, but the, the kids did not have school the next day. I know in Minnesota um, in late October, there's often what we call our MEA break, um, which was uh, a break for the teachers um, in late October. But that was usually, we'd have the Wednesday through Friday off of that week before. But I, there's a possibility some schools may have uh, mixed in a an extra day off on Monday um, to make it an even longer weekend. But uh, regardless, uh, there was no school uh, the following day. So the, the kids were basically treating it as a you know non-school night. And and with the five of them there, they decided they wanted to go rent a movie. They called over, and again, this is before the time of cell phones, so they had the phone number for the friends that the parents were visiting. They called over to that house and asked if they could bike uh, to Tom Thumb to rent a movie. Tom Thumb is a convenience store um, that was popular in, in Minnesota back in the 80s and, and early 90s. Initially, Jacob's mother, Patty, did not want the kids to go to the uh, to the Tom Thumb. It was about a two-mile bike ride, and uh, being that it was dark out already, this was uh, right around 9 o'clock at night, um, she was worried that they could get hit by a car, but they were able to get Jacob's father, uh, Jerry, on the line, and uh, as kids sometimes can do, they convinced... Uh, the one parent to overrule the other parent and uh, they got the dad's permission to bike to the Tom Thumb. There was three boys that went to Tom Thumb that night. It was Jacob, uh, who was 11, Aaron, who I believe was also 11, and Jacob's brother Trevor, who was 10 at the time. So the three boys, armed with flashlights, made the two-mile bike ride to Tom Thumb. Later, Trevor and Aaron, uh, upon speaking with police after the incident, uh, stated that while riding to, bike, uh, to Tom Thumb, they heard a rustling sound near a, a driveway. And they didn't know what it was, but it was just one of those things that just kind of you know, sat in the back of their mind. Um, they made it to the Tom Thumb, and they wanted to rent major league but it wasn't available so they rented naked gun then uh they began biking back to jacob's house got to that driveway where the uh, they had heard the rustling sound they said suddenly out of nowhere a man with something dark covering his face and holding a handgun stopped them right by the this driveway the man ordered them to put their bikes in the ditch and to lay down uh, lay face down on the ground the man then proceeded to ask each of, or, or ask them their names and their age. Trevor and Aaron answered with their names and ages, and as did Jacob. Uh, the man told Aaron and Trevor to get up and run and not look back or he would shoot them, which they did uh, run away without looking back. And that was the last time anybody or any of them saw Jacob. Uh, the boys ran the remainder of the distance back to the house uh, where Aaron's sister Rochelle was watching uh, the uh, other children. They told her what had happened and she immediately contacted Patty and Jerry and uh, 911, 911 was also called um, uh, reporting the, uh, the incident to the abduction. This began with Again, it might be one of the most popular in terms of uh, interest uh, crimes in, in the history of Minnesota. First of all, I'd like to talk about Jacob. Uh, I mentioned be in the beginning of this that there, this, this case was uh, close to me. At the time Jacob was uh, abducted, he was 11 years old. I believe I would have been almost nine years old at this time. So age-wise, he was uh, a sixth grader and I was third grader, somewhere around there. So uh, age-wise, there wasn't that much of a difference. And, and it kind of was one of those moments in your childhood where you suddenly realize that the world is a little more dangerous than, than, than you previously thought. Uh, I remember there was a lot of news coverage of this, um, a lot of parents talking, a lot of teachers talking about this. Um, this incident and uh, like I said it just kind of was one of those 
if you can't be safe in small town Minnesota, well, you know, where can you be safe? Um, so it definitely was something that uh, imprinted on me at that age and um, something I, I often thought about in terms of a boy close to my age being uh, abducted and never seen again. So I do want to focus on some of the positives um, and as well as um, remember the victims in, in a lot of these cases. So uh, uh, J uh, Jacob Whiteling was a great kid. He was an 11 year old uh, from St. Joseph, Minnesota. By all accounts, everything I read, everybody said he was a great kid, a great student and a gifted athlete. Uh, he was a skilled hockey goalie, which uh, I was a hockey goalie growing up. So uh, again, another connection there. He wanted to be a football player and he played soccer. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a father now, a father of, of three boys with my uh, youngest almost being the same age as Jacob was taken. Uh, uh, my boys are big into soccer. And, uh, again, it's just one of those things that uh, for, forever my life will be changed because, I, you know, as I did the research for this case, I couldn't help but think of how devastating it would be. Um, you know, to, to lose one of my boys, um, a boy, all of my boys are very much like Jacob, gifted athletes, um, hardworking students, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it just hits a little close to home when, when I started researching more about um, Jacob. But, uh, you know, being, that again, this was the uh, late 80s, early 90s, the, the internet's just about to be born. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of information in regards to him on a personal level, and I think that's that's probably the best way to keep it anyway, is that, uh, you know, he was your, just your typical, you know, 11-year-old kid approaching life with happiness and, and joy, and, uh, you know, what happened to him was an absolute, uh, absolute tragedy. So, uh, we'll get into the timeline now a little bit of what happened that evening, and, and now some of this is we're being able to look back on it with hindsight, you know, over over 30 years later. So uh, you know, some of it is, is stuff that wasn't known at the time, but, you know, it's just easiest to cover the timeline as we go through this. So a special shout out to, as I'm doing my research, uh, a lot of the information I got and a great timeline can be found on uh, apmreports.com uh, in the dark. Um, it's It's a... A great series, or a great yeah, series of blogs and, and podcasts in regards to this case itself. Because as you'll see as we go on, there's there's a lot more going on than just this uh, abduction. Um, this was this abduction itself, along with some of the other abductions and whatnot in the '80s, kind of changed the way that we approached uh, child abductions in Minnesota and across the country. So. So as we were talking about, it was about 9 o'clock that night that uh, Jacob was abducted by a, by a masked man with, with a gun. And he's not seen by anybody uh, after that point. Law enforcement, which in this case was sheriff's deputies, were quick to respond to the area. Um, this actually introduced a, a person into this case that, uh, that we'll bring up a couple times in the timeline. It's a man by the name of of Dan Rassier. Uh, Dan Rassier lived in the home at the end of the driveway where the abduction occurred. And uh, Dan has had the unfortunate, uh, I don't even want to call it luck, just unfortunate lack of luck to have been focus of the investigation for many, many, many years. And this is mainly because Dan was a 30-year-old male when uh, Jacob went, was, was, uh, when Jacob was abducted. He lived alone in the farmhouse at the end of the driveway um, and lived with his parents. Uh, and his parents were out of town, uh, happened to be out of town that weekend that Jacob was abducted. So he was a single guy, um, kind of kept to himself. And so there was, there was a lot of speculation and assumption made about the fact that um, just given the circumstances, uh, he you know, could potentially be a likely suspect. That evening, he actually, uh, after the the sheriff deputies arrived and the, and the, the two uh, boys, Trevor and Aaron, uh, showed the deputies the driveway in which the abduction occurred, uh, Dan Rassier actually called into the uh, 
the sheriff's department to report people with flashlights at the end of his driveway. Uh, he didn't know it at the time, uh, but he was advised by the dispatcher that it was sheriff's deputies out looking for a missing child. Thinking he could offer some help, he walked down to the end of the driveway, spoke to some of the deputies, you know, which at which point he learned it wasn't just a missing child, it was a child abduction. Based on everything that I read, uh, it didn't appear that the deputies were too inquisitive with uh, Rassier at that time. And uh, as he would later state, they'd never asked to search his house or any of the outbuildings, you know, which, which had that happened, I think uh, some of the investigation down the road, as we'll see, um, might have gone in a diff different direction. But as it was, uh, Rassier went back into his house and, and that was that for him. Now, as for the crime scene itself, we're talking about a gravel road in rural Minnesota. You know, they, there was a lot, or they were a lot of um, tire tracks and, and shoe prints. Uh, they were able to identify Jacob's shoe prints and a set of tire tracks. And uh, those became kind of the main focus, the tire tracks and, and some other impressions. Now, I will say, this is where I'll, I'll kind of tangent a little bit into my experience as a crime scene investigator. Uh, what, what you don't see in the, the TV shows and the movies, of course, is how messy, uh, in terms of just items in general that can exist within a crime scene you know in tv shows or movies it's you know a parking lot and there's one item of evidence sitting in the middle of the parking lot and that's what ties in the uh the suspect to the crime or whatever it may be uh, i once worked a homicide in a hotel parking lot and i can tell you it's almost impossible to determine what items of trash cigarette butts etc were, would be related to the crime and what wouldn't be. I mean, you'd have receipts that fell out of cars. Um, you'd have, uh, you know, in that case, you had 20, 30 cars there that all could be or, or may not, you know, one or two of them might have been involved. And, and in the, this case, none of them could have been involved. Um, you just you just don't know at that time. So, uh, again, even though this is a rural road in, um, in Minnesota, um, you just imagine all it takes is somebody throwing out some trash, cigarette butts, uh, whatever it is, and suddenly you've got a bunch of stuff in a crime scene and uh, that you don't quite know if it's going to be related to, to it or not. So in this case, there were some tire tracks they believed were related to um, the abduction. Uh, casts were made of those tire tracks. Um, some other impressions were taken. And, and rather quickly, you know, there, there was large ground search efforts that were made that evening uh, looking for Jacob and the suspect and... Unfortunately, nothing was found at that time, or I should say nothing was found, but, but Jacob wasn't found at that time. This became a, a pretty big case pretty much overnight. By the next day, the FBI was already involved, conducting aerial and ground searches, and a decision was kind of made, I guess, to go as public as possible with this case, which sometimes is a, a tactic of the law enforcement agency i think is more common now with you know the 24-hour news cycle and how people are kind of inundated with information but back then i think it was a, a little bit more a little bit more rare to have cases that that captured the national attention like like this one did because rather quickly uh you know with the fbi is getting involved and then um, within that same week the the TV show Current Affair, which was a huge deal back in back in that time period, uh, ran a news story about it. Geraldo Rivera wanted to cover it, and I mean, back in the late '80s, early '90s, uh, he was you know if he was covering something, it was a big deal. The governor uh, Rudy Perp Perpich of Minnesota at the time activated the National Guard to help uh, do a search of the area because. You know, to describe this area, I guess the best way, rural Minnesota, especially rural central, north central Minnesota, where this occurred, you know, you've got these these small towns, you know, a few thousand people in them, and then everything around there is farmland. So we're talking, um, you know, a, a gravel road that runs by, and there may be 10, 12 houses off that county road, and they're each sitting on several hundred acres of, of farmland. So, and, and dotted amongst those farmland, you've got, you know, wooded areas and, and whatnot so it was a rather extensive area to to try to search uh but they you know they, they searched as best they could I, I guess back in that back in the day 
a lot of the local sports teams uh, show support. I, I do remember this as a kid, uh, seeing it was the Minnesota Twins, the Vikings, the Timberwolves, um, all kind of were reaching out. They had uh, some of the, the major players on those teams making public comments about the case and trying to trying to draw in more attention towards it. And this is kind of the point at which, while there's a lot going on behind closed doors as they're trying to locate evidence and, and, and round up suspects, whatever it may be, you know, it's more of a time of speculation amongst the news than it was of, of real reports as regards, because there was, you know, Jacob hadn't been found, suspect hadn't been found, and it was a lot of rumors, speculation, and that kind of stuff going on. During this time, I guess within the first couple of weeks, of the investigation, a few sketches were released. Um, this was uh, sketches uh, related to a guy seen inside the Tom Thumb, um, as well as a, a, another guy who was believed to have uh, tried to abduct a, a boy down in the Minneapolis area. It was December 13th of 1989, so we're talking about a month and a half after the incident. And, and, and up until then, as I said, it's basically been a lot of news stories regarding speculation as to what might have happened or who might be involved or whatever it may be to things kind of changed for the first time um, when on December 13th, 1989, uh, a, a boy at the time, 12 years old named Jared Shiriel, and I, I'm, I really, I'm going to refer to him as Jared from now on, his last name, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it 100% accurately, but Jared is a 12 year old boy who lived in nearby Cold Spring. Now this area of, of Minnesota, the major towns kind of in the area, you've got St. Joseph, uh, and I, when I mean major, I mean a few thousand people. You've got St. Joseph, you've got Cold Spring, and you've got Painesville, and they're all kind of outside of this St. Cloud uh, area up there. So nearby Cold Spring, a uh, 12-year-old Gerald reports a sexual assault abduction that occurred in January of 1989, so about nine months before Jacob's abduction. He, he created a sketch of the man who thinks he assaulted him, and investigators start to kind of think the cases are related um, just based on, you know, I will say in 17 years of law enforcement and working in a, a, a city of roughly 70,000 people, child sexual assault reports and slash abduction reports, you know, I don't know that I ever took took one that arose to the level of, of Jacob or Jared's. Um, so to have two reports within nine months, one being an abduction and a missing child and one being an abduction and a sexual assault of a child, to me that would that would raise quite a few red flags and, and I think it did for officials at the time. But it was only a, a few days later that a man identified as Danny Heinrich, who lived in Painesville, was interviewed. And now there are a lot of different reports out there as to exactly how this all shook out with Danny back in in the early early uh, time period of 1990. Danny Heinrich was well known around the uh, Painesville area for some issues that he's caused and we'll get into those later but when Jared described both the vehicle and the suspect and, and some of the specifics about the vehicle and the suspect to the police, they had a, a pretty strong inkling that, that Danny Heinrich was behind the abduction and sexual assault of Jared. Um, so they kind of began to focus in on him, and as a result, when Jacob's case came around, you know, they, they really started to focus on this Danny Heinrich. Now, again, this is 1989. This is kind of the infancy of DNA, um, but it does look like they made several attempts to, uh, they collected body hair from Heinrich, um, they collected DNA from the sweatshirt that Gerald was wearing, or Jared, sorry, was wearing at the time, and then kind of some news hit, uh, again, really early in 1990, that, uh, that Painesville actually had a rash of molestation episodes involving young boys, um, for about a year, September of 1986 to September 1987. And we're talking about eight reports in seven different victims in the span of a year. And, and again, I just go back to what I said before. You know, 17 years in a city 30 times the size of these these three cities combined, you know, even not, not just taking me out of it, just taking in general, 
we would in those 17 years we had a few reports of of sexual sexual molestation of children um often by more likely by a family relative or family friend but stranger abduction slash sexual assaults of of young boys i said to have one or two i guess maybe unfortunately would be expected but to have eight of them in a year in a small town um i said there, there's definitely something going on here but that'll that'll come in, into play later on as we discuss so you know they continue to focus on on heinrich as uh the, the during the month of january of 1990 they got access to the vehicle that he was driving at the time that jared was uh, abducted and sexually molested jared sat in the car with the police officers and he said he was pretty sure as an eight or nine out of ten that that was the vehicle that he was in when he was abducted and, and sexually assaulted but unfortunately when uh, heinrich was brought in for a, a live lineup jared was not able to identify him heinrich's house was searched as well they were looking for anything related to Jacob's uh, abduction or disappearance at this time or Jared's abduction and sexual assault. They took some items like some police scanners and whatnot, but nothing that directly linked him to either crime. And as a result of lack of evidence from the, the house search, as well as Jared not being able to pick him out of a lineup. And I should mention at that time, uh, he had, voluntarily given up the tires from his vehicle um, to be compared against the tire marks left at the on the gravel road at the, at the scene of the abdu- of Jacob's abduction and the FBI was able to say that they while they were similar they were not an exact match so if you look at early 1990 there's a lot of steam headed towards uh, Danny Heinrich being the suspect in both Jared and Jacob's abduction and and potentially some of these earlier molestation accounts but it does not appear, based on the investigation at that time, that they had enough evidence to arrest him. Uh, I, sorry, then uh, sh- then in early February of 1990, they did find a, a fiber on Jared's clothing that was uh, a microscopic match to fibers taken from the vehicle that Heinrich owned at the time. And as a result, Heinrich was arrested. Uh, he was interviewed, denied having any involvement in in, in the uh, abduction and sexual assault, and he was later released with uh, being charged. So basically, um, the only other point of evidence in in this case back in those early 90s was a, a shoe print that was found at the crime scene. And again, it was one of those the print corresponds to Heinrich's right shoe, but it's there's not enough there to make an exact match. So. You know, of all the evidence the investigators had at the time, while everything leaned heavily towards Heinrich's potential involvement, especially in Jared's case and possibly in in Jacob's case, there really was not a direct link of evidence at that time between between, uh, the crimes and Heinrich. Now, before I get into kind of the years following, the years in between, the eventual arrest and and confession of Jacob's killer. I I guess we'll we'll talk a little bit more about Heinrich and kind of go down that rabbit hole. So Danny Heinrich was born in 1963 in Painesville, Minnesota. Had a couple brothers. His parents divorced when, uh, I think when he was around 10 years old, somewhere around there. Um... And he subsequently dropped out of high school in 10th grade. Now, around the time that he dropped out of high school, so in the 10th grade, so we're talking about, you know, somewhere in the 14 to 16 year old range, uh, he began spending some time with a guy who's later identified as Dwayne Hart. Uh, As we will eventually learn, Hart is a convicted sex offender uh, who preyed on young boys. Uh, Based on interviews, by heart, he admitted to spending time with Heinrich during this time period in which Heinrich is dropped out of school and uh, partying together, uh, drinking and whatnot at the farm uh, that will come into play later on uh, in this story. So it's it's highly possible that um, Heinrich himself was targeted uh, for some form of sexual assault by uh 
this Hart. Hart was 16 years older than him, so at the time Hart would have been in his, you know, right around 30, maybe early 30s, while uh, Heinrich is, you know, either late middle school or early high school. So it's definitely possible that at this time there was some preying on uh, Heinrich. Heinrich was also getting into trouble at this time for breaking into homes and businesses and stealing items from them. Eventually this catches up to him and uh, around the age of 17 in 1980 he's placed at the Wilmer State Hospital. Um, Basically this is an adjudication. Uh, He's a juvenile um, committing these crimes of burglary and whatnot and they think it's psychological in nature so they have him committed and uh, attempt to cure him of his his, uh, psychological issues that he has that, that lead him to these crimes. Not a lot is reported in regard or is known in regards to that time after the state hospital, but he does join the Minnesota National Guard in 1982, and he remained in there from what, everything I could research until the early 90s, which is a little odd considering that means potentially, and I couldn't find this, but his guard unit may have been activated in regards to the search for Jacob Wedling um, at the time that that he was still in that unit. So while I can't confirm that, it just it, it's highly possible that uh, he could have been involved in the search for um, Jacob via the National Guard. At the same time he's joining the National Guard, he's getting arrested for drunk driving in 1982. He's uh, committing more burglaries and thefts in 1984. And what I found interesting in the research was that in 1984, several people are saying they want to help Heinrich out because they think something's not right with him. They can't pinpoint what's wrong with him, but it he seems like a guy that just needs some help. So, you know, this is 1984. Then in 1986, uh, he gets once again caught driving drunk. Uh, he flees the officer on foot and then fights with the officer when the officer catches up to him. And then around this time period is when um, these eight assaults occur on, on seven boys. And this is all within a mile of, of the house Heinrich was living in at the time. The victim type was always the same, you know, a young boy, age 10 to 12, somewhere in that area. And same method of, of you know, he would tell them the same thing. That as after he was done sexually molesting him, he would, he would tell them to run away and not look back or he would shoot them. Um, unfortunately, later on when he's going to make a, a plea agreement in this case, uh, he... Uh, part of that plea agreement prohibits police from asking him about these sexual molestations. So he remained a suspect for all the molestations that occurred in Painesville in 1986. But, uh, you know, as we'll go into Jared's story here, you know, this is kind of, this is what kind of brought this case to an, to an eventual end here. So my hero for this story, and I'm going to try to always find someone that went above and beyond whether it be in law enforcement or the community or a victim or 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 a relative of a victim that kind of you know a lot of these cases that that have closure is the result of of somebody going above and beyond and in this case it was jared you know for having the courage at 12 years old to report the uh, abduction and molestation i know there's a lot of kids that at that age you know, be afraid to tell somebody that that happened, uh, would think it was their fault somehow, or that they were going to get in trouble for telling this. But he not only reported it, you know, he followed through with the investigation with the police. And really, over the years, because his case was never solved, just as Jacob's was never solved, um, and he was a young boy the same age as Jacob growing up, or roughly the same age as Jacob, growing up in the area that Jacob grew up in, you know, he, he was a champion for, for his case to be solved, and he stayed on top of the deputies uh, of the, the sheriff, um, Stearns County, to continue to try to push for investigation into these cases, even well beyond you when know, the statute of limitations was up on his case. He, he kept pushing because he knew someday somebody needed to, to be brought to justice. So, you know, just, just whether it was when he was a young kid and, and, and went through this horrible experience and then had the, the courage to report it and go through the lineups and sit in the car again and, and, and all the times he's had to relive it since then um, as he's fought for justice in this case. 
but the Jared's case mirrors Jacob's to a certain degree, and, and in that case, uh, I'm not going to get too into specifics, but uh, basically, uh, from everything I read, he was, you know, he was out walking late at night. I believe he'd been playing hockey, or something similar to that, um, back in the the 80s and 90s uh, in Minnesota, and, and you know, it, it can get cold enough. And this was this was uh, January, so definitely cold enough for ice to freeze. The the cities would dump water into some of the uh, local ice rinks outside and, and kids could go skate around and, and play hockey for free on these uh, ice rinks and it was kind of a common gathering area whether you're in a, a, a suburb or a small town as long as there was an ice rink and it's minnesota it's a state of hockey but kids kids get together and play hockey so jared had been doing that and he was walking home when this car pulled up next to him and and this man abducted him at gunpoint uh, i believe i read he was Kind of driven around for about an hour and a half, molested, and uh, eventually dropped off and was told if he t- ever told anybody. He could tell, uh, it was strange, it said he could tell somebody what happened, but if he ever told them who did it or they directed him towards who did it, that Heinrich would come kill him. So, you know, like I said, Jared had the strength in which to report this and to follow through with it, and for that he's definitely the, the hero in this case. But um, getting back to the timeline... He, uh, you know, we, we come into this kind of time period of the 90s now, and uh, violent crime was on the rise. All the major cities had problems with gangs and guns and drugs and homicides and whatnot, and, and one of the answers was uh, to get tough on crime. So as a result of that, some, some great advancements were made in terms of crime, and, and in 1994, the Wetterling Act was approved. And this was an, an act approved by the U.S. Congress uh, of, it was, the full name was the Jacob Oiling Crimes Against Children and Sexually Violent Offender Registration Act and Child Safety Act. So it got shortened to the Wetterling Act, but basically this was required anybody convicted of a criminal offense against a minor and they were convicted of a sexually violent felony to register with police for 10 years. So prior to that, uh, and this is, sorry, this is after release from prison, parole, or probation. So Prior to that, you could commit a sexual crime against a child, and from what I understood, as long as you did your time, whether that was all in prison or prison plus parole slash probation, once your time was up, um, you were no longer a registered sex offender, which, given some of the cases that I've heard about on true crime, rapes against uh, you know minors and, and women and that kind of stuff that was treated rather leniently in terms of punishment back in the 70s and 80s and whatnot i just can't imagine somebody going to prison for a couple years for uh, sexually assaulting a child and then being you know released into the community and has no further um, markers or anything that against them so after this um this is this is also the point in which uh, communities could the police could start to tell communities about sexual offenders living in their area so yeah so prior to 1994 there was no the, the police weren't actually allowed to tell you if your neighbor was a sex offender even if they knew so now after 1994 and because of the Wetterling Act police could tell communities where offenders were living and eventually this would be changed later on to make this a requirement so now the fact that there's websites out there dedicated to where sex offenders live in your area and, and if there's a certain level of sex offender released you know the, the there's required to be a community meeting or whatever it may be that's that's all stemming from the Wetterling act then you know you had 96 1996 you had amber alerts initiated so again back in the the time of jacob's abduction we didn't i mean granted the technology wasn't there either there wasn't a great system for alerting in the case of abductions and and as we'll see as we kind of break down what actually happened with jacob there's, there's a chance that maybe an amber alert would have made a difference in this case and then you know as we go into the the 90s or the late 90s there's not a whole lot happening with the case, at least in, in the public eye. I do remember in 97, they released an age-enhanced photo of Jacob looking, you know, what he would look at, like 18, 19 years old. And and I should say this is the, probably the time where I'll take to step aside from the story and talk about any time you have a case like this with a, a abducted child, missing child, there's always going to be a lot of tips that come in and the national attention this garnered, whether it was back in the early 80s or the late 80s, early 90s, or, or even uh, beyond. You know, there's there's always going to be people calling thinking that they either saw 
uh, Jacob or they were Jacob or whatever it may be. Unfortunately, some of this is attention seeking, whether it be for mental health issues or otherwise. Um, other times it's just, you know, good people that are misguided. And sometimes it's just somebody who honestly thinks they, they saw somebody and are trying to do the right thing. I, I myself, when I was a young officer, um, this was probably around 2007 or so, had a woman come in and, and she swore that while in Florida, she saw Jacob uh, Wetterling. And uh, I took a report about it and sent a report down to whatever agency it, it was. And unfortunately, as we're going to find out, there's zero chance that person was, was, was correct. But you know, it was one of those things that I just kind of had to step back and say, I you know, never thought as a police officer in, in the 2000s I was going to take, you know, I was going to write a report about somebody thinking they saw Jacob Werling, a kid that I grew up knowing, you know, having known was kidnapped, um, abducted uh, as a child. So anyway, so a lot of that stuff was going on, I'm sure, behind the scenes, uh, you know, reports, tips, all that kind of stuff. Then things kind of shifted in 2003, because if we remember we talked about the tire tracks that were seen at, at and there were some reports of vehicles in the area that were seen well in 2003 a man who was just gonna go by as kevin um kind of comes forward and I, I don't know i think if i remember right from the news stories and whatnot about it just kind of one of those things that just ate away at him for years and years and years but he finally came forward and admitted to driving his car in the area of the abduction site that night and I, I can't remember if it was you know what the purpose was or why you again why he waited so long but that kind of eliminated that vehicle because because he was found to have no involvement whatsoever in the abduction so that that kind of eliminated the idea of a vehicle born suspect so law enforcement now shifted and went well if, if somebody didn't take him by vehicle those tire tracks don't belong to the suspect they, you know, he had to have been taken on foot because remember the, the boy said this guy kind of appeared out of nowhere. He didn't pull up next to him in a car. Uh, he didn't have a car parked in the area that they saw. So now everything shifted back towards Dan Rassier, the, the man who lived in the house, whose driveway was involved with the abduction. If you remember, we mentioned that Dan was a, you know, a single guy, adult, 30 years old, living with his parents in this farmhouse and, and in you know, uh, uh, rural areas of Minnesota and other areas tend to be a little bit more religious and people kind of expect whether you're a man or a woman, you, you're you going to age out past 18 and somewhere in your 20s you get you meet someone and you get married and you have children and that's just kind of a, a natural cycle and anybody who doesn't follow that cycle kind of gets looked at differently in and uh, Dan Rassier was definitely looked at differently for his lifestyle um, choices and, and, and whatnot. And, and so now, you know, with, again, with law enforcement saying, now we believe this guy was on foot, now all the attention went back on Dan Rassier. And law enforcement went after him hard. And I remember this in, in the running in there. This is about the time I started, be, started being a police officer. And I just remember the news stories and whatnot, and, and a lot of people had this guy hardly kind of convicted of, of doing something to Jacob just because of the circumstances. So law enforcement, you know, uh, whether they felt the pressure or whatever it may be, kind of continued to ramp up against uh, Rass here. And finally, in, in, in 2009, Patty Wedling, uh Jacob's mother, asked to speak at the request of law enforcement they wanted Rass to have a heart to heart with Rassier. So, and Rassier agreed, and she flat out asked him if he abducted Jacob, and he said no. That clearly wasn't enough for law enforcement. Um, in July 1st of 2010, um, and this was also, I remember, a big news story, uh, they, con they conducted a search warrant on uh, Rassier's property there. Um, they were digging up what they thought were concrete slabs that could be covering Jacob's body. They were doing all sorts of stuff um, on this property. And afterwards, I, re I recall there being stories about the search warrant being a little weak and possibly um, maybe not even true in parts uh, in regards to like Dan, in the search warrant said something about Dan Rassier admitted that he likes, he was a marathon runner and he likes to run to escape. Um, and many people who run, run marathons, run long distance things, do it as an escape. It's a, 
a chance to kind of, you know, be on their own and, and doing their own thing and just kind of be caught up in that moment, um, escape everything else that's going on in life. And that was used in the search warrant as a reason to search his property is because he had admitted to, to, to somebody at some point of, of running to quote unquote escape and that, that made him look guilty. So uh, ultimately nothing was found on Rassier's property. He continued to be called a person of interest by the sheriff's department, which also didn't set well with him because people in the community treated him differently as a result of him being a, a person of, of uh, interest. And, and then things kind of went quiet again but things were still going on behind closed doors, I should say. In 2012, the BCA, uh, which is the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, they're kind of a, as close to, other than our highway patrol, they're as close to our state police agency as we have here, kind of a state level police agency that helps out with major crimes across the state. And they uh, they, they run a, a statewide crime lab, a couple different locations, but a statewide crime lab that does a lot of the processing for a lot of departments across the state but basically they they looked at the dna profile that was obtained from the sweatshirt worn by jared uh, during his abduction and sexual assault and they were able to uh, find dna from at least two people jared got not be excluded and as a result they thought they had dna in there for somebody that had that would exclude 99.5 percent of the population so it's kind of terminology for If we can find who this DNA belongs to, it's likely that this is going to be your suspect. They continue to look for DNA. I guess they found some more on a baseball hat that was taken after one of the attacks in the the 1987 case. Then, I don't know why, but it took three years, but eventually, the uh, and it might just be advancements in DNA or whatever it may be, they were able to tie the DNA from Jared's case to Danny Heinrich. So this all comes back to Heinrich, all comes back to the assaults in the Painesville area, the assault on Jared. And this kind of opens a door to, I guess, the, the, the closing of the investigation, if that makes sense. So, so that was July 10th of 2015 when the DNA was tied to uh, Heinrich. So on July 28th of 2015, so two weeks later, they searched Heinrich's home in Annandale, Minnesota and uh, they end up seizing 19 three-ring binders containing child pornography along with a bunch of other suspicious items, handcuffs, duct tape, etc. And numerous videotapes of recordings of young boys uh, or neighborhood children playing, delivering newspapers, that kind of stuff. So obviously the guy has uh, pedophiliac issues and child porn is not one of those gray areas it's black or white it's either child porn or it isn't and you either possess it or you don't and in this case he he possessed it and he, i believe he admitted to downloading the the items over the internet which um, is another crime in and of itself so he was facing several several years and basically in a, in a case he could not escape the search warrant was july 28th a few months later a criminal complaint in regards to the possession and receipt of child pornography is filed against him at the federal level and then I'm guessing again a lot of stuff is going on behind closed doors. It's not really reported what was out there, but I'm sure they were they were trying to make deals with them eventually um, and, and deals with the family because eventually in September 6th of 2016, Heinrich appears in court under a plea agreement and confesses to Jacob's abduction and murder. I'm uh, sorry, abduction, sexual assault and murder and then the assault of Jared as well. This is a really strange plea deal. I don't know that the the stuff against Jared at the time was was even still able to be charged, even if if there wasn't a plea deal in place, even if he confessed to it. I think statute of limitations had run out on that, but definitely there's no statute of limitations on murder. But as part of the plea deal, and they and they approached the Wetterlings about this, um, they agreed not to charge him or go after him uh, or go after Heinrich for the actual uh, any of the charges against Jacob. Uh, he was going to plead to the uh, possession receipt of child pornography and get his 20 years, but that was going to be it. They weren't going to come after him for any other stuff if he confessed to it. So in a way, it was almost immunity for him to confess to his more heinous crimes to take his his punishment for the child pornography. I know personally this was difficult for me. I mean, I can't put myself in the Wedling's shoes and say, you know, they haven't seen Jacob in 30 years. Um, 
and they th all they want is their boy back, and I get that. Um, but at the same time, the guy, the monster responsible for it, is not going to face any earthly justice for the crime. I mean, that's to me, that's a difficult pill to swallow. But I, I you know, at the same time, I get it too. It's it's closure. It's being able to bring Jacob home and, and give him a proper burial. And it's not like the guy isn't serving any time. It's just. You know, there, there's a chance he could see the outside of a, pr of a prison sun someday, and to a lot of people, that just doesn't sit well. So, basically, Heinrich, during his confession, admitted to everything he did that day. Uh, the details are pretty disturbing, so I won't get into them. But he did admit to see, he's driving around, saw the boys, decided he was going to abduct one of them, chose Jacob, put him in his car, drove him 30 minutes away to the Painesville area to that farm I mentioned earlier that he had hung out with with uh, Dwayne Hart and it was at that farm he sexually molested sexually assaulted uh, Jacob and then he Heinrich claims uh, he saw some cop cars in the area which timing wise might be actual squad cars coming from the St. Cloud area headed to St. Joe um, for this abduction and he freaks out and he, he shoots Jacob twice in the head and then digs a shallow grave, buries him there. He admits he goes back a year later and there's part of Jacob's jacket was sticking out of the ground so he ended up digging up what remains he could and, and moving him across the road to a different location of a deeper grave. But yeah, it, he then claims um, that he never touched another child again um, whether or not that's true obviously um, you know it, it is what it is but he uh, uh, there's nothing nothing short of the fact that he's a monster but what did happen as a result of the result of this investigation um, ultimately uh, the monster was put away Jacob was returned to his family all the questions of what happened to him where he'd been if he was still alive all that kind of stuff was answered as I mentioned several you know, crime bills and momentum towards proper police procedure and, and faster notifications result, you know, were the results of this unfortunate incident. Jacob's mother, Patty Wetterling, actually had the uh, honor of meeting once uh, at, a, at a law enforcement training thing. She actually went and served some time with the government of Minnesota. She's an elected official for several years, pushed a lot of child safety bills and that kind of stuff, which, you know, those will continue to, to provide a legacy for, for her son, Jacob, um, and the rest of the family. I've watched and listened to several interviews the Wedlings have done over the years of how, you know, how this affected them, how it affected their family. So after after Jacob was found and returned, again, a lot of sports teams, whether they be professional or kids or amateur, kind of rallied their support. There was a, a great movement. Jacob wore the number 11, and there was a lot of movement towards uh, you know youth hockey players putting 11 on their jerseys and patches and that kind of stuff to remember remember Jacob, remember who he was. So, you know, again, I, I don't ever want these cases that I cover to just to leave everybody with the, the doom and gloom that exists. There, there is good that unfortunately comes out of these unfortunate events. And uh, I, I, you know, I want to try to focus on those, those things when I can, to the best of my ability. So I know I kind of covered a lot. This is one of those cases that based on the, how long the case was in terms of the investigation, almost 30 years and, and whatnot, that I probably could have broken up into a couple episodes, but it's also a case I'm very passionate about. And well, what really wanted to cover as as my first episode. So, yeah, there's there's a lot that I probably could have broken down more and analyzed in terms of the investigation, in terms of how they you know went after suspects, non-suspects, all that kind of stuff. But I'll I'll save that in this case just just to try to keep this into one one episode here. But I want to thank you guys. I appreciate that you um, stopped by and listened to this podcast and and kind of went along with the story. I, I'm hoping as as time goes on here and I get more uh, comfortable with the podcasting and, and the writing of the episodes and whatnot, that I'll uh, be able to to stay on track a little bit more, I guess, because uh, I kind of felt like I was got off track a few times there. But um, if you have any questions, 
suggestions, anything like that, um, I do have an email. For right now, all I have is email linked to this, and it's uh, truebluecrime14 at gmail.com. Feel free to email me with any suggestions or, or you know, any, any words of, uh, of advice or encouragement or whatever it may be. If this goes well and uh, I feel like I want to keep doing it, I will uh, eventually here get the, a, a stronger social media presence, uh, kind of get get that stuff out there and try to have some more uh, fan connection that way. But for the time being, so this is my first episode, so I just wanted to put one together, see what it took in terms of the research, writing, and producing and editing, and then uh, eventually the publishing of of the podcast. And uh, I learned a lot already in this process. I'm sure I'm going to learn more as I go to edit and publish this. And uh, like I said, I just look forward to uh, hearing from you guys and uh, producing more episodes in the future. All right, everybody take care and stay safe out there. Look forward to talking to you guys next time. Later.